Religions is only in the definite regulations they lay down for the observance of certain details and of what are called rituals. And this difference is the result of the deliberate adoption by the great founders of these regulations which suited the degree of mental perfection of the people of the given period. At the root of every new doctrine upon which religions are founded, dogmas are always to be found, which have been taken from earlier religions and which had already been well fixed in the life of the people. And in this case, the saying is fully justified which has existed among people from of old. There is nothing new under the sun. The only things new in these religious teachings, as I've said, are the small details, intentionally adapted by the great founders to the degree of mental perfection of the people of the given period. And so, as the root of this same doctrine upon which the Christian religion is based, there was placed almost the whole of the previously existing great teaching which is now called Judaism, whose followers once also numbered almost, as is said, half the world. The great founders of the Christian religion, having taken the Judaic doctrine as their basis, changed only its outer details according to the degree of the mental development of the contemporaries of Jesus Christ and in it they effectively provided for everything necessary for the welfare of people. Provision was made in it, as is said, both for the soul and for the body, and it even provided all the necessary regulations for a peaceful and happy existence. And this was all surpassingly wisely provided for in such a way that this religion might be suitable also for people of much later epochs. Had the doctrine of this religion remained unchanged, it might even perhaps have suited these contemporary people who, by the way, our Mullah Nazaruddin defines by his expression, he will blink only if you poke his eye with a rafter. At its origin, there entered into the Christian religion, besides those specially established regulations for ordinary existence which met the needs of the contemporaries of Jesus Christ, also many excellent customs which were already in existence and had become well fixed in the life of the people who were followers of the Judaic religion. Even those good customs which now exist among you in the Mohammedan religion were transmitted to you from the Judaic religion. Take, for example, just that custom of Sunniyat, or circumcision, which you mentioned. This custom was at first contained in this Christian religion also, and in the beginning was obligatorily and strictly carried out by all its followers. Only subsequently did it very quickly and suddenly entirely disappear from the Christian religion. If you wish, my young friend, I will tell you in detail about the arising of this custom, and you will understand from it why a custom so good for the health and normal life of people was included in the Judaic religion. And since the Judaic doctrine was made the basis of the Christian religion, this custom also could not fail to be taken over and introduced into the process of the ordinary life of the followers of the Christian religion. This custom, which you call Sunniyat, was first created and introduced into the Judaic religious doctrine by the great Moses. And why the great Moses introduced this custom into the religion of the Judaic people, I learned from a very ancient Chaldean manuscript. It was said in this manuscript that when the great Moses was the leader of the Judaic people, and conducted them from the land of Egypt to the land of Canaan, he constated the fact during the journey that among the youths and children of the people confided to him from above, there were very widely spread the disease then called Mordorten, which contemporary people call Onanism. It was further said in the manuscript 
that having constated this fact, the great Moses was greatly perturbed, and from then on began observing very closely in order to discover the causes of this evil, and some means of uprooting it. These researches of his led this incomparable sage later to write a book under the title of Tuka Tes Nalulpan, which in contemporary language means the quintessence of my reflections. With the contents of this remarkable book, I also once happened to become acquainted. At the beginning of the explanation about the disease Mordorten, it was said, among other things, that the human organism has been brought by great nature to such perfection that each and every organ has been provided with a means of defense against every external contingency. And hence, that if any organ should function incorrectly in people, it must always be the people themselves who are to blame, owing to their own established conditions of everyday life. And concerning the causes themselves of the appearance of Mordorten among children, it was said in chapter 6, verse 11 of this incomparable book, that this disease occurs in children for the following reasons. Among the definite substances elaborated by the human organism and constantly thrown off by it as waste, there is a definite substance called kulnabo. This substance is in general elaborated in the organism of beings for the purpose of neutralizing other also definite substances necessary for the functioning of their sex organs. And it is formed and participates in the functioning of the said organs from the very beginning of the arising of the beings of both sexes, that is to say, from their infancy. Great nature has so arranged it that after its utilization, the residue of this substance is discharged from the organism of boys at the place between the Tulch Totino and the Sarnuonino, and in girls from the places between the Kartotachnian hills. The parts of the organism of boys located at the end of what is called the genital member, and which are named in this incomparable book Tulchtotino and Sarnuonino are named by contemporary medicine there glans penis and prepus penis. And the Kartotachnian hills, covering what is called the clitoris of girls, are called labia majora and labia minora, or as is said in common language, the large and small obscene lips. For the substance kulnabo, contemporary medicine has no name at all, this independent substance being entirely unknown to it. Contemporary terrestrial medicine has a name only for the general mass of those substances among which is also the substance kulnabo. And this total mass is called smegma a composition of entirely heterogeneous substances secreted by various what are called glands, which have nothing in common with each other, as, for instance, the Grease gland, the Bartolinian gland, the Cooperian, Nolniolnian, and others. The separation and volatilization of these waste substances should in accordance with the providence of great nature, be induced for the said places by means of all 